First off, I want to say um, thanks for everyone for, for making it over here today. I know there's an exciting Jupiter talk going on. I actually kind of want to be there too. Um, I'm also on the PyData uh, committee, and so I'm really uh, excited about this PyData Seattle. I think it's been really fantastic. I hope you've all had a really good time as well. Okay, so my talk today is about Bokeh and Friends. I've actually given a number of tutorials about Bokeh over the years at different PyData conferences, but it occurred to me, I think this is the first talk I've given, so I'm excited to have this opportunity as well. So what is Bokeh? So Bokeh, well, first off, who's familiar? Just show of hands. Okay, a lot of people. I'll try to run through quickly the, these parts, um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of a status update about where sort of Bokeh is, and then we're gonna talk about a few extra things that are sort of being built on top of or around Bokeh as well. So Bokeh is a library, uh, two libraries really, Python and JavaScript. It's for interactive visualizations that can have things like widgets or tools. Uh, we want to be able to have very versatile graphics, you know, if you don't need just the stock kind of chart. We want to let you have the flexibility to create all kinds of customized graphics if you need them. We want to be able to handle streaming and uh, dynamic data, possibly large data sets. Um, but this is for the browser, right? The, the target for all of these is to be published in uh, modern browsers. And that's either with or without a server, right? So we have a mode for standalone visualizations and standalone documents that can still be quite interactive, but also uh, Bokeh server uh, examples that we'll see a little bit later. The biggest thing though is no JavaScript. So I'll repeat that, no JavaScript. The main, sort of one of the main driving forces behind Bokeh is that we want to let people stay where they're comfortable, where they're already productive, they're happy in Python uh, or other languages, and they don't wanna to have to reach to JavaScript just to make these interactive visualizations. We wanna let them stay where they're already, you know, very productive. And so that's what Bokeh's for. So we took care to write all the JavaScript and uh, so you don't have to. So a little prologue. Um, it occurred to me as we're sort of careening towards a 1.0 release that I'm talking about a little bit later, I was waxing a little nostalgic, so I don't need to talk a lot about myself, but I wanted to maybe trace a few threads of what got me interested in, in Bokeh in the first place and what led up to it. So hopefully you'll indulge me just a few minutes. So who first, or who remembers Logo? A few folks? So Logo was really cool, I loved it as a kid. I think I had a cartridge on my TRS-80. It's a programming language, very simple. Uh, it had this little turtle and you could tell it to draw. You could tell it to move forward, turn left, rotate, put a pin up, put it down and draw. And what struck me about it at the time was that with very simple commands, you could make very complicated output. And that's sort of my first introduction to sort of graphics and, and drawing things. And that really made an impression on me, I guess. Um, note to myself, it occurs to me it'd be a great bokeh application to make a, a logo interpreter that can draw using bokeh, so I might. Try to do that for the next pi at a conference. Um, beyond that, the next thing that I sort of interacted with was Fractent. Does anyone remember this program at all? No one, probably. It was the DOS program. Let you draw fractals. And what at the time I thought was really amazing was that you could connect pictures you know, to math. And you could actually zoom in and out. Like you could zoom in and out on these images and it would take progressively longer and longer to draw the image because as you got further in, the precision was more and more. And so it, you know, it would take much longer to, to zoom way in. But I loved it you know, when I was younger and, and I thought it was really cool that you could connect sort of mathematical ideas directly to, to images. And I think that's very important. Um, much later, when I had started my career, I encountered things like Mod Python and Pill. This was in the late 90s. There was a uh, library lost to memory and time that you could use to create little bar charts and pie charts in reports in Apache. And so I worked at a wafer fab at the time and so we, we used this to generate these reports and I was just amazed. I was like, this is incredible. You can have real data coming in real time and you can generate these picture you know, right on the fly. And I thought that was really awesome. By any standards today, they were very simplistic, but at the time, you know, I was truly, truly impressed. Around the same time, I also made my first contribution to open source software, sort of first exposure to it really. Uh, and that was the VTK. So VTK is the Visualization Toolkit. Anyone familiar with VTK? A few folks? It is an enormous C++ library for 3D visualization pipelines. Um, it has bindings in Python and I think Perl and Tickle even. But um, I was using it for some projects at work and so I, I forget what my contribution was, but it was some minor contribution. But um, as I would later find out in my own life, uh, minor contributions are really great to have. They really add up. And so I made my first contribution there. A little bit later, I worked on another open source library uh, quite a bit more, it's called Chaco. Chaco was a bit contemporaneous with Matplotlib. It sort of, uh, I think there was a foot race for a little, a little while and then uh, eventually Matplotlib won out. Chaco was really geared towards interactive visualizations and rich clients. And it was really nice, but I think there were some lessons to learn for it, uh, from it. It was definitely very fiddly. Uh, it was kind of verbose and so it was kind of hard to put together. And so I'd like to think that I've learned some lessons from Chaco um, that we've been able to pull forward into Bokeh. 
Um, a little bit later, I also worked on Conda. So after coming to Continuum, uh, I was one of the first people that worked on Conda. And the thing I learned from that is that you know, eventually users start paying attention if they start using your, <laughs> your software. And they care that it works and that it's stable. And that's a pretty important lesson to learn. It's nice, you know, the nice thing about when a project starts is you don't have any users, right? And you can make whatever changes you want. But that's uh, maybe not such a nice thing after all. And then finally, Bokeh really sort of ties all of those lessons together and uh, brought us to where we are today. Um, Bokeh was started about hmm, four years ago. And uh, as I mentioned, we're sort of heading towards a plateau of stability. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So welcome to Bokeh. Uh, if you aren't already familiar with it, um, if you are familiar with it, I hope you'll see some new stuff today as well about Bokeh, as well as some of these other libraries that I'm going to mention. But uh, you know, it's certainly been my privilege, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work on an open source project like Bokeh that I really care about, uh, just to be able to give it away to, you know, to everyone. So just to give a little bit of context for Bokeh, I think at SciPy three years ago, uh, we had just released 0 0.5 and uh, sort of where we were. Um, I'm pretty floored by the numbers today. Um, I, you know, I'm not actually sure what to say about that. They don't really register with me. But apparently, people are using Bokeh, and that's you know, really exciting for me. Um, I always like to try to get people involved both in using Bokeh and also developing Bokeh and, and becoming new contributors. So we try to be a very welcoming uh, project. Um, and I'm really excited about that. I think we just passed 237 contributors. And again, a lot of these contributions are very small contributions, but that's fantastic. Those contributions add up. And I promise you that any open source maintainer who gets a PR from you uh, for any amount of work, big or small, will be glad to have it. And so I encourage everyone to, to become involved in open source if you can. Um, but there are a lot of people that are involved in making Bokeh. There's sort of a core team that's worked on it on and off, and other people have worked on it on and off over the years as well. But uh, certainly a lot of contributors, and there's a lot of people active on the mailing list and on Gitter and on Stack Overflow asking and answering questions. OK, so let's take a look at what Bokeh is sort of today. And then, uh, again, we'll move on to some other topics. So ironically, the first thing I want to mention is actually not about Python, even though we're at PyData. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that Bokeh, uh, Bokeh has recently added a more formal JavaScript or, or really TypeScript interface. So we're actually in the process of porting the entire Bokeh.js library to TypeScript. I think that's going to be a really good thing for long-term maintenance of Bokeh. But there's also now a TypeScript API that you can use Bokeh.js as a standalone or self-contained JavaScript library to generate visualizations. Now, again, a lot of people you know, want to use the Python bindings for Bokeh, and we, we love those. But we're trying to get more people interested in using Bokeh. We're trying to make Bokeh a little bit more of a normal JavaScript library so that we can get more people involved in developing it and using it directly as a JavaScript library. So this is just an example of what some code looks like. It's actually not very different. <coughs> excuse me, not very different from the Python code, which is nice. So Mateusz Poproski uh, has done a lot of work on Bo uh, Bokeh.js and on this API. And so again, it's very similar to the Python code, which is actually quite nice. Some other examples, some high-level charts you can create very simply with Bokeh.js. So this is all of the code to generate all of those charts. Uh, with Bokeh.js, you know, you get a pie chart or you get a, a, a box chart. They automatically come with things like little uh, hover tooltips and uh, pop-ups. So you can find out more about that from the user's guide um, online. But the main, I guess, overriding reason for the Bokeh project as a whole is we want to make it simple for people to write data science applications that are in the browser that are interactive, or, or they can deal with streaming data, can deal with large data. Um, and we want to make it very simple to write. So just there's a lot of screenshots here of some examples. And I'm going to go run some demos here in just a bit. Um, but what do we mean by simple to write uh, data, si data science apps? We mean that you can concentrate on what you're doing. They're written in Python pretty much entirely. Now, there's possibilities for using JavaScript to augment things, but by and large, you can write entirely in Python. You don't have to worry about HTML or CSS or a lot of web tech. Again, the idea is you can stay where you're productive uh, and not have to sort of reach for uh, extra tools when they're not necessary. Um, it's also very simple Python. I'll show some examples of code in just a bit, but it's, it's just simple Python scripts. There's not necessarily any special classes or frameworks that you have to plug into. If you look at the code for Bokeh server application, it looks just like a simple script that you might write, <coughs> you might write any time. Bokeh, though, is also useful for exploratory analysis, um, but sharing or publishing. Uh, Bokeh, of course, works in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we're working currently on making it work better in Jupyter Lab. Uh, but it's also good for creating these applications, or you can embed standalone documents in, in Flask or Tornado or Pyramid or Cherry Pie apps, whatever. Uh, it's easy to embed Bokeh in all kinds of ways, uh, and it's easy to publish these apps. The Bokeh server is actually very scalable. If you write these Bokeh server applications, you can put them behind a load balancer. They're very horizontally scalable. If you have a lot of users or if the app itself does a lot of work, um, you can scale them out fairly, fairly straightforwardly. But the main thing that it does, the actual 
single task that's probably the most important thing that the Bokeh server does is that it automatically mirrors uh, the Python side to the JavaScript side. So what do I mean by that? So on the Python side, you have a bunch of objects. We call these things models. Uh, they represent things like your plot, or the axes of the plot, or the data for the plot, uh, tools, or widgets, or layouts, things like that. There's a corresponding model in the JavaScript side, sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between all of these models and all of their properties. The Bokeh server keeps those things in sync. And that's actually a really valuable, <clears throat> valuable feature, and it affords a lot of capabilities. So for instance, you could imagine uh, I want to have a, the ability to draw a selection using a lasso tool over a bunch of scatter points, and maybe based on that selection, I want to compute something. I want to compute uh, some statistical regression for the lines that I selected or run some kind of scikit-learn model on it. So because of this synchronization, that can happen. The Python side can be informed of that selection, can trigger off running real Python code, and then it can further update data sources, update other models that represent the data, and then of course the plot can update. And so this two-way communication is what affords all of the capabilities that we'll see here in just a minute uh, for Bokeh server apps. But that's the, that's the main thing that it affords. It lets you connect these front-end applications, which can have plots or data tables or all kinds of things, directly to the full PyData stack. And so the full PyData stack is NumPy and SciPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn and Scikit-Image and Dask and all of these things. So another thing that, um, well, actually, let me go ahead and show a couple of demos first. So I'm going to sort of intersperse things. I have a lot of windows open, so I'm just going to tab over and try to find a couple of interesting ones right quick. So here's maybe the canonical simple example of a bokeh application. So I will make this bigger by showing this over at the table, and so I had everything minimized to get as much as possible. But here's a very simple example. It just shows uh, a sign grading. I've got uh, some sliders that let me control the offset and the amplitude and, and things like that. And so I can scrub these sliders and the data update, it's, and so therefore the plot updates. And so I can change the amplitude or I can change the phase or the frequency. I can say my sine wave for pi data Seattle. And that's not how you spell Seattle. <laughs> but, uh, we'll see that the plot updates. And so what does the code for that look like? Maybe it's instructive to take a quick look. So let me go ahead and bring this here. Hopefully, we'll see that it's fairly straightforward. So I've got a nice doc string at the top telling me how to run this example. And all these examples, by the way, are in the Bokeh GitHub repo, right? So this is all BSD license, including the server. It's all on GitHub under the Bokeh organization. So here's an example. I've got my doc string. I've got a few imports uh, from Bokeh. Uh, I set up some data. There's a few lines here. I compute some NumPy you know, arrays, uh, lint space, and I compute the sine curve. Um, for the plot itself, I've got one line that creates the plot, and then another line that creates the actual line that I want to draw, line of code, rather, that creates the line that I want to draw on the plot. So that's pretty much as minimal as I think we can get. And then for each of the widgets, there's, again, one line as well for a text box and four sliders. I can configure things like the start and stop regions, um, you know, the increment that I wanted to, to, uh, to use whenever I scrub the slider. And then finally, where the work actually happens is I have some callbacks. So if the title changes its value, I want to call this update title function. And all that does is it sets the plot title to whatever the text box value is. Similarly, if any of the sliders change their value, I want to call this update data function, which simply gets all the values from the sliders and computes a new sine curve using those values. And then it sets the data on the data source to this new value, uh, which again, causes the plot to update automatically. Lastly, I just I put these things in a, a layout you know, with a, a column. Uh, and then I add them to my document and I'm done. Right? So I can run this, uh, similar to the Jupyter Notebook, I have a, a bokeh command I call bokeh serve on this, function, on this uh, script sliders.py, and then that will give me this, this application. <coughs> and so again, we can see if I, change, if I change the title, title of the plot changes, if I scrub the slider, that's used to compute new data for the plot. So that's one example. Uh, another example, which is maybe a an interesting comparison here. Uh, this is a reproduction of the Shiny Movie Explorer in Python. And so this is taking some data about movies and basically letting you have a little interface that uh, allows you to query or, or dig into this data. I've got a nice hover tooltip that lets me see, you know, the Matrix Revolutions in 2003 made $139 million. You can see that the ones that are uh, tinted, uh, shaded, Gold are the ones that won an Oscar. I added a little extra bit here. The ones that are shaded purple are Razzie winners. So you can see there were some Razzie winners that made a lot of money, despite also winning a Razzie. Looks like that was the Transformers. So, <clears throat> so what can we do this? So we can scrub, for instance, the number of minimum reviews, and we can see that this can update. Um, you know, 
filter by the number of dollars at the box office that was made, that sort of thing. Uh, minimum number of Oscar wins, obviously that's gonna update the, the plot as well. So again, this is meant to be a fairly direct comparison. People have asked the question, where is Shiny for Python? Hopefully Bokeh and, and some of these other tools I mentioned can fill that need and fill that gap. Okay, so that's a good example. Um, good one. If you go to demo.bokehplots.com, there's actually several of these examples hosted you can take a look at. Um, there's our sliders. Here's another example that I like. It's fairly simple. Uh, this is the auto MPG or cars data set. Um, and it's just a little app that lets you slice and dice and say, I want to see the displacement versus the horsepower. And maybe I want to shade by, you know, maybe I don't want any shading or sorry, maybe I don't want uh, any size. Maybe I don't want any shading or maybe I want to, you know, change the size by the, the MPG and sort of see that change. Um, and all of that just is fairly easy to write as a bokeh application. So that's another nice one I like to show off. <coughs> all right. Um, I think that's pretty good. Oh, one last one here. So this is also another one I like to show off. This is just a reproduction of Gapminder. So you might remember sort of one of the first uh, famous TED Talks, or at least the, one that, the first one that I really remember is this uh, Gapminder data set that shows uh, life expectancy versus uh, uh, fertility rates uh, over time. And so here we've reproduced that chart here, and we have a little slider where we can scrub through and see how this changes over time, and we've added a little play button. And again, this is just Python code. There's a Python script that defines all the elements in this plot. Uh, when you press the play button, it can add a, a little periodic callback to actually advance the slider, which causes it to update. Uh, but it's similar to that sliders.py uh, example that I showed. It's not very much code. It's, again, in GitHub under the examples app directory. You can see all of these. Okay. Um, all right. So let me go ahead and get back to a few slides for a minute. So another thing that Bokeh can handle really well is streaming data, right? And so the, fairly recently, I guess within the last year, maybe a little bit more, We've added some methods to our column data source. The column data source is sort of the foundational, fundamental data object in Bokeh that's used to transfer data between Python and the browser. And we added some methods to it that can be useful in certain use cases. So there's a stream method. Uh, if you have the use case where you're incrementally, sort of marginally adding data to the end of like a time series, say, and you're, you're not updating the first data points, but you're adding data points to the end, the stream data can be used to do that in a much more efficient way. So, you can always sort of stream data to Bokeh by just changing all of your data, but then you're sending all of the data every time. And so that can be not as efficient. So the stream is very useful if you need to append to the data. And I'll see an example of that in a minute. And there's also a dot patch to the column data source, which allows you to update random points in the middle. So you could imagine if you have a large image and you want to change, for instance, just a region of the image in the middle, you can basically do NumPy slicing to update just the tiny subset of an image instead of sending the entire data for the new image. So that can be useful as well. That's actually going to be used with, um, in conjunction with the data shader project that I'm mentioning a little bit later uh, to do some streaming data shader plots. We'll talk about that later. Let's actually see a streaming example right quick. So again, this, this streaming example is not using that stream API, but it's just sending a new set of data for the coordinates every iteration. And that's fine if you have a small amount of data. But again, if you have a lot of data, you probably want to try to do something a little bit better. And so this example is maybe a little bit more instructive. This is a market simulation. So there's one script. Uh, it computes the synthetic market data. It's just a log normal distribution. Uh, it computes the open, high, low, close. It computes these other indicators. I think they're called MACD indicators at the bottom. I'm not such a finance person. Um, it creates these widgets up top that let you change the, you know, I can change the mean if I want to get really Rich, I can increase that mean of the simulation or I can make it really volatile. Maybe I want to see a different uh, exponential moving average instead of the one that I had. And so all the code to do all of that and to have this scalable, deployable web app, um, well, I, I don't know, how many, how many lines of code do you think you could do that in? People always lowball the answer. <laughs> So, but it's, un, it's under 100 lines of code, right? So, I mean, if you can have a sort of a scalable, deployable web application that's streaming data, computing the synthetic data, providing this interaction automatically with widgets and under 100 lines of Python, I think you're doing pretty good, um, if I can brag a little bit. So that's, uh, that's an example. And again, you can see the, the code for that on GitHub. If we go to github.com, maybe worth showing explicitly. Go to here. So this is the Bokeh GitHub. There's actually a Bokeh organization with a few other repos in it, but if you go to the examples app directory, uh, there's several examples here. There's <coughs> um, 
selection histogram, which maybe I don't have running, but uh, the cross filter one that I ran earlier, the gap minder one that I ran earlier, movies, this one is OHLC for open, high, low, close. And again, we can look at the main.py for it um, is not too much Python code and fairly simple, straightforward Python code. There's actually no classes here. It's just a, a fairly simple strip. Um, not that you can't use classes. If you want to you know, create classes and organize your application more uh, comprehensively, you can certainly do that, but Bokeh doesn't require anything like that. We try to keep it very simple um, and accessible for everybody. So um, the next thing uh, is to mention custom extensions. So maybe also about a year ago, we realized that as much as we want to do with Bokeh, we'll never ever be able to satisfy every possible use case that, that users come up with. Because users have really awesome, interesting use cases, and they have a lot of things that they want to do that uh, are perfectly reasonable and sensible to, to do or to want to do, but that maybe don't make sense to put in the core library, because then it adds a maintenance burden to the, you know, the, the few core developers that work on Bokeh. And so, we decided that the thing to do was to make Bokeh more easily extensible. And so it's possible to create these models. As I said, a model is a thing like a plot or an axis or a data source. Um, it's possible to create your own models that have their own JavaScript implementation that you can then use just like a regular Bokeh model, right? So you can create some custom uh, div here. It's a special slider display uh, that does something special. Maybe it displays the slider in a different way or wraps some other JavaScript slider. Um, but if you change the value, then automatically these properties, the text and slider properties that are mirrored in the Python implementation automatically get synchronized, just like any other Bokeh model. It gets synchronized automatically. And so this is a very powerful way for adding extensions. So you can use this to add capability for things like wrapping different widgets. So Bokeh has a, a range slider built in. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you want to use the ion range slider, which has some nice facilities. Maybe there's some other fancy uh, JavaScript library of the week that you want to be able to connect to Python, uh, Python analytical code. <coughs> you can use these uh, extensions to wrap those widgets. In fact, uh, this was used specifically uh, by Sarah Bird, who's a great uh, Bokeh developer, on a particular project, and she wanted to use this ion range slider, so she wrapped it, and it worked really great. You can also use it to adapt something like a 3D library. So Bokeh itself does not have any 3D capability built in at the moment. Um, I don't know what the future will bring, um, but you know, right now it's really focused on 2D visualizations, and, uh, and that's great, but you know, maybe you want to wrap some 3D uh, library. So there's several 3D JavaScript libraries that you could use uh, that you could connect to, again, Python, you know, you can connect to NumPy and SciPy and Pandas by making an extension that wraps it. So there's an example, Surface 3D, uh, that does exactly that, and you can see that. In fact, take a quick look. Don't know if I have it running, but I go to demo.bokehplots.com. We can see how things work over the conference Wi-Fi. So this is again. So I wrapped this viz. To viz.js is kind of a, a simple toy 3D library, but I chose it just for its simplicity. But I made a little extension that wraps it, and so whenever I update the data source, it automatically adapts it to whatever viz.js is expecting. There's basically just a few lines of JavaScript translation code, and now I have this updating, interacting uh, 3D plot. And that's true for a lot of things. So anything that you want to put on the front end and connect to Python, Bokeh can offer you a pathway to do that. Uh, another thing that you can currently do is, for instance, add LaTeX labels. So I hope to be able to add more support built into Bokeh for this. This is asked for a lot, especially from uh, academic corners. Um, we currently have an example now where you can use the Kotec library to add LaTeX labels um, in and around your plot. Again, I hope someday we can add a little bit more um, built-in integration, but this is a nice feature in the meantime that lets you still have capability, uh, even though it's something's not in the core library. That's really the, the basis of this whole extension mechanism is that the community doesn't have to wait for us. It's also maybe a nice way to lower the bar for contributions. People can create a custom extension. They don't have to get involved in the full development or full building of the Bokeh uh, library. It's kind of a, you know, it's, it's much better than it used to be, but it's still a little bit of a burden to have to pull down the source and build the JavaScript and build the Python, and so it's a little bit of work. But this allows you to do it without having to modify. You can just install a standard release of Bokeh, write an extension, and then if it's something really useful, you can present it to the community. And uh, might be a path to getting into the core library eventually, uh, or maybe it's just something you can share. And I hope to have uh, a better mechanism for sharing these kinds of extensions, making them more discoverable across the community. I think that will really magnify their value. That's something we want to try to do before 1.0. So putting all that together, um, so another example that I've been working on on and off in different ways actually for quite a while since near the beginning of Bokeh, um, and it's this nice uh, spectrogram example. 
And the reason that I like to show it now is that the first time I wrote this example, when Bokeh was first starting, uh, was almost entirely written in CoffeeScript. So Bokeh.js is actually written in CoffeeScript. And it's about 600 lines of CoffeeScript. And so there was like a little bit of Python Bokeh and then 600 lines, this big giant pile of JavaScript. That's, you know, it was nice to look at, but that's not, I don't want to write 600 lines of JavaScript, and I'm sure most people uh, here at PyData probably don't either. Um, so over the years, I've been trying to add you know, the features and get to the goal of being able to write a pure Python application that really has this spectrogram capability. Pretty much there. There's a little bit of a custom extension in this that actually could be gotten rid of with our new patch capability. I just haven't had a chance to do it yet. But so this is a nice um, example, I think. So this is reading my microphone. Uh, it's showing the signal here. It's showing a power spectrum here. It's doing the Fourier transform and the waterfall plot. Um, and there's just a fun little graphic sort of equalizer that's just a binning of the power spectrum around, uh, around the outside of a circular uh, little plot there just for fun. Where are your formants? I'm sorry? Ah, so, I, so this is meant to be an illustrative example. If you really want to make a very precise spectrogram, you probably need something a little bit better. I guess here's a nice demonstration. Though. Thank you for asking. So let's see. So this will be fun because at a previous conference, uh, Peter Wang, who was the co-founder of Continuum, but also one of the uh, uh, other people behind Bokeh, um, he's who I worked on, uh, or who, who I worked with on Chaco many years ago, uh, he instructed me to whistle in the middle of one of my talks, whereupon everyone found out that I don't know how to whistle. But uh, so let me go ahead and find a, <laughs> a tone generator. And so we can maybe see something a little bit better here. So we can see a nice spike. If I go ahead and increase things there, I've got a nice little uh, pick maybe a square wave or whatever we want. So it's really kind of cool. I don't know, I'm happy to be able to have this kind of capability doable pretty much entirely from Python. A little bit later this year, I will have a pure Python version where there's not even the, the small custom extension that's uh, currently used for the streaming. But that's sort of where we've been trying to get to. And that's sort of one of the implicit, you know, not like a, an explicit goal of the project, but it sort of it helped us drive direction because we knew we wanted to get to being able to do this kind of thing with pure Python. Um, yeah, I think that's probably right. So there is possible to scale this down, but I think the sampling rate is probably not, I, like it's not a very high sampling rate either. Uh, so I think um, definitely I've run this through songs. It just depends. I'm not a speech audio expert as well. <laughs> that's just an area where if you wanna make this better, I would love to have a discussion and collaborate and try to make this something that's even more actually useful than just you know, demonstrative. One and two are too close together and you can't get the piece. Yeah. That might just have to do again with uh, the sampling rate that I've chosen. I'm using, by the way, I'm using Pi Audio for this. Um, Pi Audio is kind of hard to install on a lot of platforms, but recently, thanks to Philip uh, Rudiger, um, there's a synthetic mode now where you can just run it, and it'll actually just run some synthetic, synthetic data through, so you can just see it operate and see it run without actually having to have Pi, Pi Audio installed. Um, okay, cool. We'll close that one down. Great. So anyway, so that's, that's Bokeh. So if, for anyone that's curious about this actual image that's, that's here, where did this come from? Uh, it was a postmodern jukebox, which is a lot of fun. They, they take pop songs and they re genreify them. And uh, I think this was their version of Shake It Off that they were doing that I took that image from. So. Um, another thing that's really important to mention about, about Bokeh is that it's not necessarily just for Python. So I mentioned that there's really two libraries. There's Bokeh.js in the client, there's the Python library. The way they communicate is by a declarative JSON specification that they pass back and forth. Um, might be over a WebSocket for the server for performance reasons. But any language that can generate the right pile of JSON can create these bokeh plots in the browser. So uh, Ryan Hafen, who's a big R person, he's one of our collaborators on the DARPA X Data Initiative. Uh, he liked bokeh, but he's a big R person, so he made R bokeh. And I'm actually happy to, uh, pleased to be able to say that there's been some funding recently to continue working on R bokeh and to make it even more stable and maintainable in the long term. And so R bokeh is a pretty nice uh, facility already. You can go check out uh, hafen.github.io slash rbokeh and get a, a better feel for all the kinds of things you can do with rbokeh and improvements are being added uh, as we speak. Uh, there's also a bokeh Scala uh, binding. One of the core uh, bokeh devs, Mateusz Pop uh, Poproszki, um, he's actually a big Scala fan. I think he's probably likes Scala more than Python, actually. Um, but he, so he's made uh, bindings for bokeh and Scala. And really, any language you want, you could, you know, create uh, a, a bindings for. So there used to be a bokeh.jl binding. Um, the person that maintained that uh, eventually had to, to move on to other things. I would love to see a Julia binding for bokeh uh, sort of come to life again if anyone knows Julia and is interested. 
Um, would love to work on that. I've threatened for a while to make a, like a MATLAB bokeh binding, but I don't think I would ever do that. So, uh, but anyway, the, the, the principle is there is that lots of languages could make use of bokeh and to use, um, you know, bokeh to generate visualizations in the browser. All right, so what are, what's coming up? So uh, a thing that's been asked for for a long time is PNG and SVG export, and that's done. Very happy to report. Long standing issue. Last release, 0.12.6, we actually uh, finally were able to add that. There are a number of, um, I guess, technical trade offs and hurdles that sort of led to that not being uh, an easy thing to do. But you can now programmatically, headlessly export uh, PNGs uh, or SVGs of individual canvases. So, that's happy. Um, network and graph rendering. This is also another long-standing issue. So um, you've always been able to draw networks or graphs in Bokeh. If you lay all the data out in Python, you can just send the coordinates for the visual shapes to Bokeh.js. But Bokeh.js then doesn't know anything about the actual graph data as graph data. You can't just say, I want to find all the neighbors of a node or something. It doesn't know anything about the graph structure. So this is really to add uh, some knowledge of graph structure to Bokeh.js and uh, rendering. There's an open PR for that, and I'm also happy to say that's also part of some funded work. So that is going to be ongoing, and that should be in the next release. Uh, binary Array Protocol. So the, the low-level Bokeh Server Protocol is actually uh, already built to be able to ha handle multiple uh, chunk buffers. We just haven't really taken good advantage of that yet. And so what I'd like to do, hopefully for the next release, maybe the one after, um, is to be able to send things like NumPy arrays without copying them uh, you know, to the extent possible. We used to actually just JSON everything, and that worked, but it was pretty slow in a lot of cases. We then moved to actually a base64 encoding for numeric arrays, and that sped things up quite a bit, but there's still a lot of room there, which is actually a great place to be when you have low-hanging fruit. And so I think we can basically send NumPy arrays fairly directly straight into JavaScript typed arrays without you know, a minimal of copying, and I think that's going to offer a pretty big performance benefits in certain use cases. So excited about that. Um, better JupyterLab support. As I mentioned, um, you know, there's the big JupyterLab talk going on right now. Um, and JupyterLab is sort of the way forward for you know, all of Jupyter, and we want to make sure the Bokeh integrates with it really well. So they have their new MIME extension me mechanism. We want to make sure Bokeh uses that for standalone plots, and then for embedded server plots, uh, make that work as well, probably using iframes. Uh, we also want to do Altair and Vega Lite integration. So uh, if you're familiar with uh, Jeff here, it's also here, and uh, um, <clears throat> Dick Vanderplas, who gave a great key, uh, keynote the other day, um, you know, there's Altair and Vega Lite of these other JSON specifications for very high-level plotting. Uh, we'd like to be able to turn those into bokeh plots, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Jake mentioned that he'd love a, a good way for Altair plots to be able to be saved as PNGs and, and uh, SVGs. So if they can convert Altair into uh, bokeh, they can save them as SVGs and PNGs now. I also think it's a nice, maybe possible workflow where people can create high-level charts with Altair or, or Vega Lite, but can then add extra bells and whistles to, right? Uh, bokeh has all this capability for you know, embedding in layouts with widgets and adding custom JS callbacks or attaching to a server, and all that would work fine. You could sort of start with your base plot, you easily create with Altair or Vega Lite, uh, and then adorn it with a lot of bokeh functionality. Uh, animations and smooth transitions, something Peter's really uh, excited about, we'll get to that eventually as well. Uh, also making Bokeh.js a first class project, again, a JavaScript library that JavaScript programmers might want to use or contribute to. Uh, I'll take full, <laughs> full responsibility. Bokeh.js is kind of a weird, oddball JavaScript library. I didn't really know any JavaScript when I wrote it and uh, sort of got by on the strength of my previous experience working on visualization tools. But it's kind of a weird library, and so we're trying to clean it up, convert it to TypeScript, make it more easily installable and usable, and uh, uh, something that other JavaScript developers might want to look at. I also want to expand WebGL capability. There's some current partial WebGL capability. Um, it's a little bit hard to maintain. The people that were maintaining the WebGL ca capability don't really work on Bokeh anymore, but uh, I want to look at a library called Regal, which I've seen some really good things about lately, which I think would be a, a better fit for Bokeh uh, in terms of adding uh, expanded WebGL and, and more supportable WebGL uh, capability. So I want to look at that soon as well. Uh, and then 1.0. So we have two releases planned, uh, 0 0.12.7 and 0 0.12.8. Uh, and then a round of more polish and cleanup, and then we want to have our 1.0 release. So this is pretty much the list of important things we want to try to do before 1.0, and it's not a very big list, although some of the tasks are somewhat involved. But apart from that, of course, there's lots of, uh, again, polish and bug fixing and uh, expanding the docs and things like that. But I'm, I'm happy to say that we're you know, not reaching a point of completion, but really you know, a point of a plateau of stability. Uh, we want to make Bokeh something very stable for other projects to build on. So let's talk about some of those. So one of them is hollow views. So hollow views, <clears throat> first let me say, should be considered a replacement for bokeh.charts. So we tried to add a very high level charting API directly to bokeh. 
Um, the, again, it's a matter of maintenance. The folks that worked on that don't really work on it anymore. Um, and when you have to allocate scarce resources, you have to make decisions. Uh, we decided to trying to make the core of Bokeh as, as solid as possible was the best use of resources, especially because there was this other project, Holoviews, which already existed and was great, and they added Bokeh integration. Uh, I work with some of the developers as my colleagues. Um, I would say Holoviews has already surpassed where Bokeh.charts was in pretty much every regard, uh, and I would encourage everyone to use it going forward. If you want a high-level interface on top of Bokeh for sort of exploratory data analysis, um, you know, very high-level uh, Holoviews is what you want. And so let's take a look at some examples. So really the idea behind all of these is that you annotate your data. So here you might have a pandas data frame, and I want to specify what are the key dimensions, what are the value dimensions, and then I just call scatter on it, and I get a scatter. And that's fairly simple and basic, and something that you would expect, and hopefully not too much, too much work. But you can also do things like have compositional layout, <coughs> very simply. So here, for instance, I've got my scatter, and I might want to call HP histogram on the histogram of the data, and now I can simply get this nice layout without having to expressly import or call you know, row or column layout primitives. Um, another thing we can do with how use is slice and dice. So here I've got a bunch of data and I want to use this ds.select to select a few different states uh, and a few different years there. And then I want to pass that to my hollow views bar charts. And now I get this nice grouped bar, automatically you know, cycles, colors, that sort of thing, automatically generates a legend. Uh, so again, it's a very high level interface on top of Bokeh. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at it. Another thing we can do is easily interact with our data. So Holoviews, as I, I said, it's really, it's, um, as opposed to a data visualization language, it's almost a uh, visualization data language. That's kind of a subtle distinction, but it's really about annotating what are the different dimensions of your data so that uh, Holoviews can decide what to do with it. So you can say, I want to attach these di dimensions to visual quantities, and if I don't do anything with the last dimension, Holoviews can, for instance, automatically pop up a slider. So now that I can scrub through and see the different hours. And as I mentioned, if you actually look at one of these Holoviews objects, you can see that it really is just, it's the data with some image, you know, the image data is, for instance, an X-ray or a NumPy array, but then there's some annotations that specify what are the different dimensions represent. Uh, going back to easily interact, you can also create Bokeh server applications with them, right? So Holoviews now allows you to create Bokeh server applications with perhaps considerably less code. So here, for instance, is instead of that hollow map from the last slide, it's called a dynamic map. There's a function called interactive Clifford that I'm not showing here, but it's in the documentation, which creates this Clifford fractal. <coughs> and it simply, this is the entire amount of code, right? I, I, I give it that interactive Clifford that can generate the actual data for the drawing and pass it to my dynamic map, set my ranges. It can automatically attach the stream for the pointer. So now I have this interactive pointer. It creates sliders automatically for the things that uh, the dimensions I haven't specified visual properties for, uh, and everything is sort of here. So let's take a look. I go back at maybe a couple of actual examples from Holoviews. So first off, the Holoviews documentation is fantastic. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that the Holoviews devs have actually managed to use the PNG export capability before I was able to use it to automatically generate thumbnails for their gallery. And they have a quite extensive gallery. They have a lot of things going on here in their uh, Gallery. They also have this reference gallery that's sort of for more sim you know, simple, task-oriented uh, gallery that's here. Uh, but they also have the, the main gallery, which is a bit more uh, sophisticated examples. So anyway, we can take a look at a bunch of those. Um, here's a nice one I like, this measles example. Uh, I've probably seen this chart in various guises. But this, they break up their examples nicely as well. They talk about how do we declare the data, and how do we specify dimensions, and then how do we specify the visual properties of our data that we want to plot. And that's uh, a bit different. So here we go. So this is a nice plot. It has all of this, and it's not too much code to generate. I think I'm actually running way behind time. Um, show a couple more things. Uh, there was the measles one. Census. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Coming back to uh, fractals. Here's a nice bokeh application that, <coughs> excuse me, uses uh, Holoviews to generate a bokeh application that again now can update, and I can update the histogram on the side. Um, it sort of comes back to that fractant <laughs> thing that I had before. They wrote that as well. Um, this is also using Data Shader, which I guess I may not actually have too much time to talk about. This is a full 15 million point data set, the New York City Taxi data set, and it's generating that cross section using Numba to efficiently slice that out. And again, Holoviews to sort of compose those things together. Maybe in the last couple of minutes here, uh, I should try to say at least a couple of words about Data Shader, at least the slides. I think I have two minutes, is that correct? One minute, okay, sorry. Um, I like doing demos. All right, so last few seconds here then. 
Data Shader is a library for dealing with larger data sets. If you have a lot of points, um, you have implicit problems with them. Uh, overplotting, uh, you saturate all the pixels. Um, you can try to apply alpha, you still can end up with overplotting. If you set the alpha too low, it's underplotting. Binning problems if you decide to do that. So Data Shader is a, a pipeline for doing rendering. Tries to solve some of these problems automatically and across large data sets. It works really well with Bokeh. Um, if you use, uh, I have that slide in the wrong place, never mind. Dask was <laughs> used by Bokeh to create a nice Dask dashboard. Um, lastly, there's some resources here if you download the slides from the link I gave at the beginning. Uh, and lastly, just you know, download it, try it, contribute, and if it's appropriate, engage with us some work. Uh, all the commercial uh, engagements definitely help support Bokeh and, and help us inform our open source. So sorry I didn't leave enough time for questions. Or maybe I did, I don't know. Was that five minutes to questions? Or? Um, we have room for one quick question okay. and then probably five minutes till the next session. So yeah. do we have a quick question? I'll start right here. Yeah, so in the beginning you had talked about how Bokeh was used for data exploration and for data visualization, I'm assuming after modeling. Um, can you speak maybe a little bit about what Bokeh might look if you were trying to put it into production, if you wanted to show like a client something or things like that? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's a couple of different ways to use Bokeh. The first decision you probably want to make is, do I need to run real Python code you know, in response to events? And if the answer is no, um, then you can use what's called a standalone document. <clears throat> These work great in either uh, exported uh, static notebooks. They work great in, in embedding in a Flask or app. It's just very simple. It's just HTML and JavaScript. You could send it to an email. There's no server required. If you want to have uh, actual Python code run, if that's you know, uh, what you want to do, a selection triggers a scikit-learn run or something like that, then you want to use the Bokeh server. And so then there's a little bit more to deal with because you have to figure out how do I want to deploy this. There's quite a lot of instruction in the user's guide about how to deploy behind, for instance, Nginx or behind Apache. Um, and there'll probably be some services in the next year that help uh, automate that orchestration. And then there's a lot of information on the mailing list as well. But that's the first decision to make is do I need to run Python code? Uh, if I do, I want the server. And if I don't, then I can probably get away with a standalone app, which will be a little bit simpler in terms of uh, deployment. But the code is, like I said, if you look at the examples under examples app, they're all fairly straightforward, simple scripts. To run it, you just run bokeh serve on the directory or the script. Uh, and again, if you need to scale out, they're typically horizontally scalable. They don't share state, so you can just run more behind a load balancer. If you, know, if you, need, if you have 10 users, you can run one. If you have you know, 10 million users or something, you might need to run quite a few more, depending on what the app does. It's sort of a trade-off between how much work does the app actually do versus how many users, right? I mean, we can't predict. Bokeh doesn't make the work disappear, right? <laughs> it's got to be spread across you know, whatever amount of compute you have. And so that ratio is going to depend on what the app does and how many users you have. <laughs>